you can't have too much democracy when you're asking people to go back to the ballot boxes and vote with more information. If you disagree, give us a call. 0344 499 1000 is the number you need. Or even if you agree and you want to voice your opinion and add your voice to the debate, you can also text us to 87222. Text the word talk followed by your message. Uh, those text messages will cost 25 pence per text plus your standard network, Greg. But of course, it's free to tweet us and tweet us at talk radio um femi uh, uh, we've spoken before uh, not in the studio actually actually i don't think live but we've spoken before uh, tell us a little bit more about what our future our choice does basically we go around the country uh, mobilizing young people and really having that conversation with people who voted to leave asking them why did you want brexit does this brexit that's been delivered does it match up with what you wanted when you voted for it and generally speaking people who voted for brexit wanted three things uh, more control over their country their laws a better NHS, and to be better off. Now, what Theresa May has delivered is a Brexit deal that means that we are bound by the rules of the EU, but have zero zero say over those rules. I mean, right now, as an EU member, the UK has 73 of the 750 members of the European Parliament. When you do the maths, that means we have three times the voting weight of the average EU country. That's a lot of control. Whereas what she's offering us is having no control at all, yet still being bound by the rules. Now, that's not what people voted for. As for the NHS... uh, British Medical Association says it's bad for the NHS, so it doesn't really add up there. And young people s- voted heavily against this, and we're the ones who will be most affected by it. That's what our future of choice is there to make the point of. And it's interesting uh, because we talked about, I mean, the withdrawal agreement that has come out now. And of course, let's 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 be clear: this is a an uh, an agreement on how we exit mm-hmm. the EU. This yep. is not an agreement of what the future deal yep. is going yep. to look like. And of course, uh, we are seeing that. Well, I want to come to free movement of people Mm. in a second because it is beyond me how we're celebrating that we're losing the right to free movement. But let's let's set that aside. And actually, I'm quite interested to find out whether or not um, immigration was a big thing of what you come across on the ground. But let's Mm. let's just pick up on on the on the stuff that you're talking now. You know, it's bad for the NHS. We of course, there's the famous bus, 350 million for the NHS. Of course, that's now proven to have been a complete fallacy because it never took into account the money that comes back to us. Um, I've just done a, a sort of a, a small... It took me about five minutes to look this up, and it was the, the Office of National Statistics. Mm-hmm. And basically, we're talking... The money that we give to Europe is 1% of our GDP. It's about 8.1 billion quid after you get your rebates and the money that we can calculate that comes back from the EU to fund various projects. And actually, when you break that down, the ONS have got a fantastic little gadget that if you put the money in, it tells you how much it actually costs per person. Mm. So we're actually talking about the money that we give to the EU accounts for £123 per year per person. Mm. That's what we're arguing about here. Yeah. Um, And then when you look at that compared with the fact that right now that money goes towards everything the EU does, everything that we currently do as 28 countries working together, Mm. is that that's what that money pays for. I mean, you think about the fact that the EU has 40 agencies dotted around Europe, which do governmental functions like uh, testing chemicals to make sure chemicals are okay, um, uh, checking so medicines are okay, like the European Medicines Agency, all those things that governments would otherwise do by themselves. We share the cost for that among yeah. 28 countries. So we put in a, li- a little bit and we get a lot back. If we put all of that on the UK taxpayer alone, pretending that there'll be more money is mathematically insane. Yeah. And also, you know, it, it's also quite insane to take the word of um, Theresa May right now. And I think part of the withdrawal agreement says no more spending vast sums of money to sending it to the EU, hmm. meaning we can spend it n- on our NHS instead. Now, I think it's a bit disingenuous because you can't guarantee that that money will be spent on the NHS. Uh, now, Sean has called us from Gosport. Welcome to the show, Sean. What do you want to say? Good afternoon, Alexis. Good afternoon. I was expecting uh, your thanks. call. Is this Sean who tweeted me? It is indeed. Hi, Sean. Thank you for calling, Sean. What do you want to say, mate? Oh, uh, some of what you guys are saying makes makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I've been campaigning and speaking about our people's vote for nearly 18 months now from the Brexit side of things. Um, and I get shouted at quite a lot because a lot of people don't want to vote again. But from from my point of view, I don't see any other way around it. The, the simple fact is Parliament doesn't represent the people um, and we need to have another vote so we can vote for Brexit again. So, you, so you, you're not happy with the deal that Theresa May has given us? 
No, I'm not, Femi. And I'm not happy with a lot of things you keep saying on the radio and on the TV stations as well. For example? You, you know, you, you're touring around the radio stations saying we didn't know what we voted for. I, 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 have, I, haven't, I haven't said that. I, I, I just outlined what people voted for because we've been, we've been touring the country asking people what they voted for, people who voted for Brexit in areas like Hull, Swansea, and they say they wanted more control over their laws, a better NHS, and to be better off. Uh, why did you personally want to vote for Brexit? Well for, well, for me personally, it wasn't necessarily just the money issue. It was just the case I was never asked if I wanted to go in to the European Union in the first place. Okay, but but, what, but we are where we are right now. As for whether or not we, as for how we actually leave, or whether or not we should leave, what do you want by leaving? But to leave the European Union, all the institutions, the single market, the customs union, the whole shabudo. I haven't. I, haven't, I don't want a hokey cokey relationship, mm. which is what we're going to have with. Uh, Sort of Theresa May's deal, which is like one foot in, one foot out. It's it's worse than Remain, if you ask me. But the, but the ballot and paper that, didn't. That, that's the, my opinion. Um, but the ballot paper didn't mention uh, the single market of the customs union. Yes, it was talked about, and there were various people that went one way or the other in terms of uh, like you had um, um, Daniel Hanan saying absolutely nobody is talking about threatening our place in the single market, and they had all kinds of different things. But what was on the ballot paper was, do you want to leave the EU or do you want to stay in the EU? And what Theresa May is offering us is leaving the EU. It's just a really, really bad way of doing it. <laughs> well, if you count that it's, this as leaving the European Union, then I don't think you've been listening to the debate because this bill keeps us in the customs union for a start. We're not going to have a say on any of the laws or that sort of okay. stuff. OK, Sean, so, so, it's, so it's you're... not really leaving, is it? OK, so, Sean, would it, be, would it be fair, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but would it be fair to say that you're one of the uh, leavers who would prefer a no-deal Brexit? Um, I, I don't actually think there is a no-deal Brexit. It's something that's been created by politicians sure. and campaigners such as Femi just to try and keep us in the European no, Union. No, what, 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 hang on a minute, hang on a minute, hang on a minute. What I'm asking is... What kind of Brexit do you want to see? You're one of the people who says, let's not give them any money. And from March 2019, we just drop off and we just find our own way with our own laws, our own control of whatever it means, our money, our laws and our borders. That's what you want. As I understand it, if we leave in March next year, we go into World Trade Organization rules. Now, Femi studied the European Union law and all the rest of it, so he could probably inform your listeners better than I could. But... That's what we voted for. We didn't vote to stay half in, half out. We didn't vote to say, oh, um, let's face it, stay in the customs union and the secret market and keep bits of the European Union. That wasn't on the ballot. It was remain or leave. Remain had two years to make its case to remain in the EU, and they lost the referendum. And that's why I'm so cross with all this, because... Our democracy has been dragged through the mud by people like Femi, but, and but, I'm sick to the back teeth of it. Hang, hang on, Sean, hang on. I'm going to let Femi come in uh, here, but I don't quite... I mean, you're using sort of quite that sort of powerful, big words language. He's, he's trampling all over our democracy. How? How can you be trampling democracy when you are going out, asking people whether they're happy with a deal or not, informing people of the actual facts, and let's not get into an argument of who said what, but let's both agree that both sides got things wrong during the lead up to the referendum. How are you so affronted by someone who doesn't want to see their country suffer 8% loss to GDP, which is exactly what the government said was going to happen if we fall onto WTO rules? But are we just all going to say, oh, yeah, we're going to be worse off, but hey, people voted for it one day in 2016, therefore we just need to accept it. That's not democracy, Sean. As I understand it, that 8% hit to GDP, according to the government's own forecast, was spread over, I think it was 15 years. I don't have the research to have. Even if it is 15 years, did somebody advertise that to, to the Leave voters? Did they say, OK, if you vote Leave and we we, vote, we leave without a deal, we're going to have an 8% drop in 15 years? I mean, I, I remember people telling us that this was going to be see us all better off this is going to be the easiest deal in history we're all doing it for the good of the country not to lose eight percent of gdp no matter how over how many years we do it i, I don't think it's got anything to do with economics to be honest with you i think it's got to do with national identity and at the moment i don't feel like the country feels european it feels it wants to be british well and being part of the european union doesn't make us british but i we think want to I... be on our own we want to we want to be a free trading nation outside of the European Union. They've got trade deals in place at the moment with South Korea, 
and Japan, and both South Korea and Japan don't have to sign up to all of the rules of the single market. Uh, well, so why is the European Union, which you love so much, given preferential treatment to countries outside of the European Union? So uh, I think it comes down to a matter of definition. Um, for example, Norway is, is Norway in the is Norway in the European Union? Uh, in name only, yes. No, but is, is it actually is it a member of the European Union? Mm, technically speaking, no. No, but, um, but it's but it's still bound by the rules of the EU. Correct. So that, doesn't that mean that it's possible to leave the EU but still be bound by the rules, which is what Theresa May is offering us? Mm, but it's not quite what I voted for. I mean, I've just but, 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 but that's, 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 the, that's the thing. Sec, hang on a sec for me. Okay. Don't talk over me because you do a lot of this on the radio as well, and that makes me really cross. Sure, go ahead. Go ahead. All I'm saying to you is that the European Union has offered trading arrangements to other countries from outside the EU, and there's no strings attached. So, for example, South Korea and Japan are not bound by the single market's rules and regulations. They're not bound by freedom of movement. So how come they can give those kind of preferential trading arrangements and political relationships to country outside the EU, but they won't allow a country that's like kind of leaving the same sort of thing? I think it's important to remember that we are one of, well, one of two um, countries <laughs> in the actual EU that actually literally overlaps with another EU country. Japan doesn't share a land border with, 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 with the EU. Japan does not literally overlap with, with, with the island of Ireland. And so as far as them being, there being strings attached, there was always going to be strings attached. But it's important to really go back to that issue regarding Norway. It is possible to leave the EU, but still be bound by the rules. Now, as you said, that's not what you voted for. But the fact is, you could say, if we get given a choice, do you want to leave the EU or not leave the EU? You can't complain that things that weren't on the ballot paper aren't being delivered. Unless we have a fresh vote where we actually can see what's on the ballot paper, do you accept this deal or do you want to remain in the EU? That is a far more informed choice because you can actually say, actually, this is on the ballot paper because this deal actually refers to a, a concrete text, 600 pages, where we can actually see exactly line by line what we're voting for. I think that that's far more democratic than the vote we had in 2016. I, I disagree with you. I was fully informed when I made my vote. I haven't changed my mind. Okay. I, know hundreds of, I know hundreds of people in gospel who feel exactly the same. We're sick to death of it. We want to get on with this. And people like you are dragging your heels, trying to keep us in against our will. And I'll tell you something, if we have another vote, we're going to vote leave again, and we're going to completely sink your argument all over again. Then let's do that. Let's do that. I agree with you. Let's, let's no do that. Mistake. Let's do that. OK, Sean, Sean, I'm going to have to leave it there, but I think you've had a fair crack of the whip. That was Sean from Gosport. Now let's go to Callum in Cardiff. Welcome to the show, Callum. What do you want to say? Hi, good afternoon, folks. Hi. I generally dis disagree with the idea that... Um, that uh, I've spoken about this before. We, I, I don't understand if there was a people's vote, which I could theoretically get on board with. Mm. I don't understand why Remain would be an option. Surely it's between checkers and a no-deal Brexit. Well, the, well, Callum, just... You know, just so Femi doesn't take all the heat on this, um, it was Theresa May herself, right, who has basically been working the hustle. Now, I can say that because I've been one, so I know what it's like, uh, of saying to people, it's either my deal or no Brexit at all. That's what she's saying to Brexiteers. Or, and to Remainers, she's saying it's either my deal or no deal. So that option of no Brexit has actually now been put on the table, if you like, by Theresa May herself. Yeah, she. When you saw her speech, when she actually came out after um, laying out the uh, the paper for this, she actually came out and mumbled it that she said, "Oh, just remain as an option." And nobody would back that. It, it, it's political suicide for them to go back to a remain. It's and and for the point on uh, people aren't informed, and now they are informed. I, st I still don't think the the key arguments have even been made properly. I mean. People talk about immigration and why immigration is good for the country, but they don't talk generally about what free movement does. They're not. They're not. They're not saying. They're generally going. Oh, uh, they support. So, so what does free movement do, Callum? What does free movement do in your eyes? It allows uh, business to uh, access a bigger talent pool at a quicker notice, but it also provides a lack of control of the quantity and the quality of the people who come. So you, can make, you could say mass immigration does this, but that's not what we're talking about. Free movement is uncontrolled, 
not controllable by our law. Is, 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 it, is, is it not controllable? I mean, the EU says that in order to move to another EU country, you need to either have a job or have enough money that you won't be a burden on their welfare state and have your own medical insurance, comprehensive medical insurance. That means that, that under EU law, you can only come here if you're either contributing to your economy or you're not going to be a burden on the economy. So I don't see... Are you saying, are you implying that the tens of thousands of Roma now homeless in London came because they had a job? I'm 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 I, I I'm, I'm saying those are the rules of the EU. Just, I'm saying those are the rules that. of the EU. I understand that, but look at the implementation and our laws. So hang on, Callum. Uh, hang on, Callum. Who's implement? Who's in charge of implementing our own laws? What do you mean implementing our own laws? They who's in charge of implementing laws. those laws? The European Union. No, 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 no it's no, not. No, 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 the Home Secretary is in charge of implementing those laws. I, I don't quite understand what you're trying we to We have at. the right, as Femi explained to you just then, we have the right to ask EU citizens to leave the country if they cannot prove that they can sustain themselves and not be a burden to our welfare system. It's the fact that we choose not, not to... Yeah, but the fact that we choose not to apply that, you cannot pin that on the European Union. Other countries do that. Mm -hmm. Switzerland does it. Belgium does it. Germany does it. Not, not to get bogged down on this, but you'd require... You're talking about deportation, not preventing... It. You're not talking about people not coming. You're talking about stronger deportation. Wait, wait, that's, wait. That's so, what but, you're advocating but, but if we're talking about not simply not allowing people into the, into the country, are you saying that post-Brexit you won't allow people to come here just to visit? Yeah, with a visa. Which means you can actually but, 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 but then, but, in, But then if they overstay their visa, then we're again talking about deportation. Yes, but on a much smaller, much more controlled scale. Why? Why? So how, 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 what makes you think it's going to be much smaller, much more controlled? Because, say, um, for businesses at the moment, you can actually import wholesale people from, say, like Romania, which I have experience being, uh, being a consultant for Health Wales, but they'll import using agencies from across the EU large sections of people. Now, if there's a demand in a certain area, you can say, no, you can't import such a large amount of people because there's a working demand that hasn't been met in that area at the moment. But at the moment, as it stands is, people can come and then you have a you have a right to deport them not a right to stop them from coming but, but again are we are we seriously saying that after brexit we will then we then stop people from coming into the country as, as just as a, as a rule so but, not so we'll, is, we will so just to come here to come made. so 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 a a french person just to come here for on a tourist we need a tourist visa just to come here and visit I, mean, I don't yeah. think that would help our tourism tourism industry if you had to you need to get a visa apply for a visa to come here from europe yeah, but it would help the working class that's wage has been suppressed severely. Well, I mean, the the, the recent report by the um, by the migration annual annual committee shows that uh, the effect of immigration on 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 the lowest wages has been marginal, and the bigger effect has been the, actually the, the vote to Brexit vote for Brexit itself by the depreciation of the value of the pound. So, so actually, and when you add to that the fact that the free movement is accompanied with all the other benefits of the single market, no, as a rule, immigration has not lowered the wages of people no. on the Lowest no, 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 no. The free market doesn't actually benefit us as much as it benefits the other countries in the EU. But it still benefits I mean, I keep, us. I keep, I, keep, I keep saying this to people. We are in the top three budget, not budget, uh, trade surpluses of almost every single EU country. The only country in the EU that we have a trade surplus with is Ireland. All the rest of our surpluses where we actually make our money through foreign exchange are China, Qatar. Saudi Arabia, that why would it be beneficial for us to be locked in a club where we are importing at a loss when outside where we can't make trade deals and where we can't control the rate of exchange, why would it be better for us to surely we can get markets what, 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 where we can buy more fairly from outside the EU when our business generally is outside the EU? Fixing the deficit and making it so that we export more than more than we import. That's about investing in infrastructure, infrastructure and investing in industry and making sure we can sell things. There's nothing currently stopping us from 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 selling stuff to, you, you to just, Europe or, 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 or to point. Japan. And as and as that's for not, as for using not. as for using Saudi Arabia as an example, most of what we sell to them are weapons, which uh, let's not say not exactly the most moral industry. I, and I'm, I, didn't I, I, say, I didn't say import or export. I said trade deficit and surplus. You mix up the two concepts. 
Okay, but well, but trade deficit and surplus. Well, you got a trade deficit if you're if you're import if you're exporting less than you than you import. But I really want to go back to your first point about um, why is why we should remain beyond the ballot paper. Um, you're you're arguing that because we voted to leave in 2016, remaining in the EU should not be an option. Is that is that your position? Yes, we voted to leave the European Union, so we triggered we triggered Article. Uh, Okay, but but I would I would I would also say I would also say that Labour lost its elections in in 2015 2017. Does that mean that Labour should never get a vote again? Never Labour should never be on the ballot paper again. That's I've got to go for a break there, Callum. I'm sorry to to leave it so short, but I think you had a very uh, fair crack at the whip. Um, I think it it is a point that a lot of people are putting out there. Even some remainders mm. have conceded mm. that perhaps remain should not be on the ballot paper. We'll pick this up uh, on the other side of the break. With me, I have Femi from Our Future, Our Choice, and we have been dealing with a a couple of calls. Uh, I've also got a couple of clips to play you. Um, in fact, let's 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 go for this. Uh, let's go for this clip. Uh, this was. Tim Martin, um, who was on the show previously, the Jeremy Carl show, and I was listening to it on the way in. And the thing, I don't know how you feel, Femi, but I get, I, I, I get very upset that two years down the line, and this isn't, this is, uh, th- by the way, I, I should pre- precursor this this comment to this is not a criticism of Jeremy, who's a is a, an amazing presenter, and and I love actually listening to his show every time I'm on my way in because he makes me laugh. And Haley said, "Yeah, great producer. Yes, Haley, you did a great job." Uh, um, and it's very difficult when you're a journalist and when you're, you're you're facilitating a debate or when you're interviewing someone to keep track of of people saying things which are kind of opinions mm. dressed up as fact. Yep. This must frustrate you yeah. immensely because I, I cannot believe that two years down the line we're dealing with this sort of thing. Have a listen. The main thing is you avoid paying $39 billion on day one. Uh, you, avoid, you get rid of the tariffs on oranges, coffee, uh, and uh, 12,000 other things, children's clothes, that the EU forces us to charge. You know where the tariffs go? To the UK Treasury, no. So that was Tim Martin there, uh, Weatherspoons Tim Martin. He was a big, a big uh, Brexit fan, telling us about the 39 billion uh, that this withdrawal agreement uh, is is part of, um, and also talking about the tariffs. And I, I cannot believe that two years down the line we are still dealing with this stuff. So first yeah. of all, let's let's deal with it together. My understanding, and tell me if I'm wrong. Yeah. My understanding is that 39 billion is is money that we've agreed to pay. Yeah. This is legally binding stuff that we have said, look, you know, when there was a project and we were before Brexit, we said, yep, yeah, we'll pay for that too. You know, we're all part of... This is like agreeing, I don't know, agreeing to buy a house, then changing your mind, going, well, no, I don't want it. Basically, so I'm not going to pay for it. If, we were, if we're going to use just like a, like a concrete example so people can visualise it, imagine if, well, let's say the EU works together, there's 28 countries and they agree... We're going to build this farm in, the, in this in this location, yeah. and they and they all agree that we're going to put that farm. And they start building the farm, and then halfway through, one country decides actually we're not going to we're not going to be contributing that money, even yeah. though they've already agreed that they're all going to be working together. So countries have actually put money into this. They spent time that they put the resources, bought the materials, but now the, the project can't be finished because one country's pulled out. That would be a breach of contract. And anyone who's saying that we can simply walk away is act is asking for the UK to go back on its deal. Let's at least be as good as the Lannisters and actually pay our debts. <laughs> uh, I love a bit of Game of Thrones. Uh, no, but, and, and again, think of it and to, to the, the, the hard Brexiteers who go, well, I don't care what we signed. First of all, it's a legal document. That mm-hmm. would see us get dragged through the courts exactly. in perpetuity exactly. because it's not as if they're going to turn around and go, oh, well, you're all right. Hmm. Don't worry about it. So, And second of all, your attitude is let's not pay it, mm. walk away so we can go and strike deals with <laughs> other countries. Yep. What makes you think a country will strike a deal with you when they've just witnessed you walking away from an agreed signed deal? Yep. I never understood that. So let's park that. This whole idea that we don't pay that. Or the other thing you hear, uh, Jacob Rees Mogg, I think, um, who wonderfully was described in an article today uh, by Marina Hyde, who you have to read if, if you don't. Uh, she, he was described as the pretend aristocrat, the talentless Mr. Ripley. <laughs> <laughs> it, did, it did make me laugh. But he keeps saying, what are we getting for our 39 billion? Mm. And the thing is, you're not getting anything. This is money you've already agreed to pay. (laughs) You're not going to get anything in return. This is your obligation. So, okay, let's park that for a second. Let's go to the tariffs. Mm -hmm. Uh, Again, you see people like John Redwood. Again, Jacob Rees-Mogg 
keep quoting the fact that we can drop our tariffs and everything mm-hmm. will be cheaper. And they always mention oranges and coffee. Yep. Talk to us about that. Okay, so firstly, name, I, and I actually spoke to Tim Martin at, at Tory you conference. Did. You made a little video, didn't yeah, you? Exactly. It's up on your feed. Yeah. And, I, and, I made, and I made the point that, all right, tell me which country does most of its trade or gets most of its food from countries that aren't in its own continent. And the only country you could come up with was Australia, which, as we know, is its own continent apart from New Zealand. But the point is, Countries do most of their trade with the countries that are closest by. It's but it's such a basic rule of economics that in economics they call it the gravity rule. So because it's more expensive, I mean, just think about it for yourself. It, what is going to be more expensive to send a product to France or to Japan? If it's further away, it costs more. That is the general rule. So even Donald Trump, when he started his little trade war with the rest of the world, he left Canada and Mexico out of it at the start because not even Donald Trump was crazy enough to disrupt trade with his closest partners. Now. As for as for the idea of of tariffs, uh, okay. So the the, the idea <laughs> is the idea is that the EU has tariffs which it puts on products which come in, and that that makes it more expensive, and that we could get cheaper food if we left the EU. Again, as I mentioned before, we get most of our, countries always get most of their food from countries that are close by. Secondly, if we were to actually drop our tariffs on everything. There is a reason why those tariffs exist. They aren't there to just protect um, French businesses or German businesses. They're there to protect UK businesses. If we did not have tariffs on Jap- on Chinese steel, given the extent to which Jap- the, the Chinese steel industry is subsidized by the Chinese government, our steel industries would be wiped out. Okay, okay. Uh, but let, let me play devil's advocate here mm. because they will turn around and uh, Mark will go, well, no, we wouldn't do it on steel. We'd do it on things we don't make. So, you know, they'll go, well, we don't make any coffee. We don't make any, we don't have an orange producing. So we'll drop the tariffs on there. But am I right in thinking that actually the tariffs and, and uh, a person called Jim Cornelius has done fantastic work on mm. this on Twitter. Um there are no tariffs on oranges and coffee. Mm, yep. uh, and in, uh, we, and in, we, fact, in fact, most of the poorest nations in the world yep. have got zero tariff agreements with the EU. Yeah, it's called the EBA, the Everything But Arms Agreement, which is with uh, 33 countries in Africa, which means that they can sell us pretty much anything they like completely tariff free. So this idea that we can save a whole bunch of money by dropping tariffs is simply a lie. So what do you make of people like uh, uh, Tim, uh, who comes on, uh, you know, talking about still two years later this has been explained to him you i've seen you yeah, tell him yeah. i've seen people tell Re- jacob rees mogg that he's wrong about the, you know even the sun who who he retweeted which mm-hmm. was that whole yeah. let's drop the tariffs and everything even the sun had to print an apology yet jacob rees mogg up until last week mm. is repeating the same lies do you think we'll ever be able to move on if people like that don't get challenged and somehow I don't I want to say the word reprimanded, but that's kind of makes me sound stupid. But we cannot continue with people coming on to national radio or television talking absolute inaccurate rubbish. Yeah, and it's it's a, it's a serious problem because quite simply and people often have this argument that one side was educated and one side um one side wasn't educated. Let's say we had this referendum on uh nuclear physics. Let's say oh, it was on which nuclear isotope should be used in our in our factories. You wouldn't be able to call somebody that made a decision that actually was harmful in the end uneducated. Because I'll tell you right now, if I hadn't happened to study EU law, I could not tell you which way I would have voted. Oh yeah. Um because Quite, this is an extremely complicated thing. It is not up to the public to have studied all the ins and outs of international trade. But that's what we have Parliament for. That's yeah. what we have MPs for. Yeah, that's what that's, that's what that's what they're there for. I mean, I I mean, I, I spend half of my time explaining the basics of EU law, not to Brexit voters, to Remainers, because they didn't know either. But yeah. the fact the fact is, in fact, it was actually it was actually uh, I think it was three weeks ago that I had to go on a Twitter rant against the, against the BBC because their definition of the single market was wrong, and they changed it two days later after I had a go at them. If even the BBC does not know the basics of why it is economically beneficial to be in the EU, then what kind of chance did anybody else stand? Okay, well, Peter might be able to help us out here. Peter from Wimbledon, welcome to the show, Peter. What do you want to say? Oh, hi, good afternoon, guys. You took the words out of my mouth. Uh, this issue of people like Tim Martin, uh, it's it's one of the you know few issues where keep, keep keep me awake at night. To be honest with you, this, this, people are allowed to spout nonsense on the national radio and TV, and there are so many of gullible people and very extremely naive and without knowledge who believe them. And those are the ones who are screaming down the radio, "We need to leave now," and we should have left like back in 2016 and so on. Uh, people like Tim Martin, they, they prey on those people and they use. Then people, uh, 
ill-informed. I'm but not, but, but I, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't call them gullible. I, I'd, I'd say they were just ordinary people who who have more who have other things in life to be dealing with other than being experts on e, on EU law. I mean, as I said, if if I'd have heard Tim Martin saying that and I hadn't had an EU law background, I might have believed it as well. The fact is, and it's, and it doesn't make I'm not better than anybody because I happen to choose this subject or this subject. I got lucky. The fact is we can't call people who believe... I mean, I believe that people have the right to be able to trust their media and trust their politicians. Now, if it's the media and the politicians that are lying to us, that's on them. That's not because people are gullible. Well, you, you, you're you right. But the reason they're getting away with it because we we don't have any, any, any checks or system in place where, for instance, you interview Tim Martin and he says a lie. We should have a big sound. Liar! <laughs> well, yeah, I dream of that, Peter. I dream. I've, I've talked to Haley here about having a big buzzer that anyone who kind of comes on, you know, next time I have Sir Bill Cash on, mm. who tells me how undemocratic the EU is, a big alarm should go off. Uh, but you know what? The problem is, though, Peter, do you think that would make a blind bit of difference? Look at Trump. Uh, look at. I mean, Brexit is is become an ideological issue, and I have found that I, I'm interested to, see, to get Femi's point of view as well here, and yours, Peter. That when I deal with Brexiteers, sometimes the harder you try to say, "But look, this stuff is incorrect. This stuff is factually uh, wrong." What you've been given, they will retreat more inside their shell and say, "No, no, 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 no. You're just wrong." You know. It, it was geniuses like, and I know I, I use that term very loosely and on purpose, uh, like Kellyanne Conway, who said, we've got alternative hmm. facts. Yeah, absolutely. We, we live in a world where anybody can just say, well, I don't buy your version of the facts. I, I like these. Fa- I like Tim Martin's facts better than Femi's. Hmm. So well, go on, Peter. I'm sorry. People prefer some people prefer believing conspiracy theories and so on and so on rather than rather than hard facts. And the thing is, it's a given there are vast Kind of population in this country, which is, I would imagine to say 10, 20 percent, who are prepared to eat grass to, just to kick the foreigners out. And those people actually who believe, I mean, the family must have come across those people who confuse, let's say, ECJ, which is European Court of Human Rights. Uh, yeah. and, and people like Farage prey on this. You know, they, they convince people that ECJ is the court which basically keep uh, criminals in this country not allowing them to deport them, which is European Court of Human Rights job is uh, to look after people with human rights, for instance, no matter what nationality where you're from. But I just, and, I just want to... And, and, and leaving EU will never ever um, uh, uh, mean that we're going to leave European Court of Human Rights. But a lot of people believe that. And they're coming on the station and saying, yeah, we, wanna, we, wanna, we want this change to happen. And, and for anyone, believe, remain or leave her to say that I knew what I voted for in 2016. It's just a big lie again, because there's such a variety of issues on a, such a complex matters. I wasn't aware, I voted Remain, but I wasn't aware of, aware of so many things I know mm-hmm. now. And, and for anyone to say uh, uh, that, for instance, we, having a second vote, we're going to undermine our democracy, is, uh, I've said the example before, is if you go and buy the house, for instance, and, and you, you decide to buy the house, you, you put an offer, and then after the survey come back, you find a lot of problems with it, surely you should be given a chance to change your mind. And, and more informed decision will always trump less informed one. And, and that's the fact of life. And somehow to say that second vote is going to divide the country even more or somehow is going to undermine democracy is just a fallacy. And, and I think it's used constantly by Brexiteers because they know there is no more new lies they can sell to the British public. The British public is much more informed now than it were two years ago. And new lies to sell to, it, to us, they're, only, they're really, really hard to come by for them. And okay. they know. That's why they're scared of it. And in my opinion, one more point, guys, but about yeah. the... The, the, the Brexit deal, no deal, or Theresa May's deal. I think Brexit has missed the point here. I think they, they, they're probably going to score their own goal, or maybe they just play in the game here. For them to, receive, to achieve Brexit, the only option is to go with Theresa May's deal. The other options, like no deal or people's vote, is not acceptable to them. A parliament never going to pass uh, uh, leaving the EU without a trade deal. So the only option is going to be people's vote. And, and they're scared of it as well. So even though Bojo and others are appearing on different news channels and, and, and plotting to, to dismiss Theresa May and vote to vote down the, the, the deal. For them, the only deal on the table is that one. Otherwise, there'll be no Brexit, and I hope it won't be. OK, Peter, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to take a little break, but we're going to be straight back after that. I know that you go around the country and you you predominantly, with our future on choice, you target leave areas, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, 
And you've been doing most of your traveling up north. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that. What are you finding? What are the differences between the, the north, the south? Are you finding different attitudes, especially the northeast? So yeah, I know yeah. that you've been to a lot yeah. of Sunderland. Well, I mean, I was born in Darlington. So the idea that the north could get screwed by Brexit is deeply personal to me. And I think people just don't get why people in those areas voted for Brexit. Imagine if you have lived in, lived in let's say, some Sunderland your entire life. You see, you, you remember that Margaret Thatcher... Um, completely asset stripped your entire region, um, taking away the industries, the shipyards, and you know that neither government has actually made things get better in your area. Mm. You know that Labour knows that they're always going to win there, so they don't do anything. They know that the Conservatives know they're never going to, they're never going to, sorry, Labour knows they're never going to lose there, Conservatives know they're never going to win there, so there's no political incentive to actually do anything to improve your life. And so no matter which way you vote, nothing ever gets better. And then here comes this Brexit thing that suggests that, oh, we might actually make, be able to make a vote that will actually change things, shake things up. Maybe there's a chance that things might get better. And the only person telling you that you should vote the other way and vote to stay in the EU is David Cameron. Hmm. Which way are you going to vote? Quite simply, the reason why the Brexit vote happened is because the political system has thoroughly failed, specifically those areas that voted for Brexit. Because let's, let's face it, if you, if you were born in Hull, you do not have the same opportunities as somebody born in Greater London. That is an inequality that simply has not been addressed by British politics and people wanted to shake up British politics. And, and by success, successive governments, we're yeah. not talking about just, just the Tories, we're not talking no. about just uh, Labour. They, they, you know, Auster altogether, they've been ignored. Yeah. Areas that have been ignored. Austerity made it worse, but it is something that's gone on for 40 years. I mean, and the thing is, that is, like I said, it's an it's an inequality that just simply hasn't been addressed, and that is what needs to be addressed. And the the tragedy of it is, a, an economic hit is not going to make Westminster suddenly start caring about Hull or Swansea or Darlington or Sunderland. An economic hit is going to make Westminster do what it always does, which is protect the areas it actually cares about, and that's London. London will survive, and the areas that voted for Brexit, the areas that desperately need to change the most, things only get worse there. And I, and I find it absolutely unacceptable. If you take Sunderland, for example, there's a Nissan factory there that sends 75% of its cars to mainland Europe. And, they, and there are 35,000 jobs across the Northeast that rely on that factory. And the reason that factory is there, even though it sends most of its cars to mainland Europe, is because we're in the EU... Anything made in, the, in this country, it's like selling the next door to get it get it across Europe. What's when you explain this when you go up to Sunderland mm. and you speak to the people who work in these factories? Mm. What's their reaction now? I, I actually went up there about a month and a half ago, and I spoke to a guy who worked in in uh, in, in the Nissan factory, and he was there with his wife and, and his and his new baby, and he said, um, "My my boss said that our jobs are safe," and. Well, Nissan's saying a different thing. Nissan's saying that they warn they warn their they, they warn their their employees that this would this would be a bad thing. And the thing is, the Japanese have said that if there is the reason why they build factories in the UK is because we're a gateway to the rest of Europe. So his job is just not safe. But I'm not sure it's 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 fully sunk in yet. And I, I because I think we have this thing of the liberal metropolitan elite. Now I work in human rights. I've worked in internationally and. We have very much forgotten about just how bad this regional inequality is. Mm. And Brexit very much woke me up. And I'll be actually grateful to Brexit, if Brexit stops, for waking us up to the real problems that need to be addressed. But in order to address those problems, we need time, resources, and, and, and money. And if, those, if the people in the Northeast get screwed by Brexit after they're the ones that needed, that needed the help the most, that will be a tragedy that I, uh, I won't be able to tolerate. And yet people call you undemocratic. And I think we've had a, a tweet here calling you a federalist as well. <laughs> wow. Uh, just for caring about your fellow citizens. Uh, Craig has called from Oxford. Welcome to the show, Craig. What do you want to say? Afternoon, guys. Yeah, um, it was just sort of based on your previous caller and some of what Fem has been saying, in that um, I voted for Brexit and I'm not afraid of no deal. Um, Even though we'll see us be poorer, you're not afraid of that? You don't mind that? No deal is not permanent. Theresa May's deal has the potential to be permanent. It's certainly not going to get any better because there's no incentive for the EU to make it better. Right. And without their permission, we can't leave that deal. I see. No so you deal... think that no deal no deal means we, we, we drop with, with no agreements, but we will, in time, figure out a free trade agreement with Europe or wherever everyone will be doing our own deal. So we're not... I, I see your point. So we're not going to be in permanent no deal status. 
No, um, my main thing is, 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 is what the entire negotiation has proven is that there's not a decent chess player in Westminster because none of them understand um, tactics and strategy. Now, just hear me out a second, right? There's no way the EU were ever going to give us a good deal in this negotiation period because they cannot afford to lose face. They simply cannot give us a good deal because Italy want, would want one, Spain, um, Greece. Italy want doesn't want to leave the EU. Deal. Uh, Craig, the the last poll okay. showed that 85% support for staying in the EU. So that argument that there's all these countries waiting to leave, it's just not there, mate. But carry on. Okay. Well, they're, they're not prospering, let's just say. So it doesn't mean they want to leave the EU. Greece is not prospering, but but Greece doesn't want to leave the EU. But I, I just I just don't want to let you get away with this whole sort of uh, storyline that there's so many countries wanting to leave and the EU need to make an example of us. But I won't interrupt you again. Off you go, Craig. OK, so that they, they cannot give us a good deal just in case anyone else ever decided to get to the point where we've got to. Not saying they want to be there now, but in the future. They cannot give us a good deal. Well, okay. That being said, all we could ever do is go to the table, try and get as close as we can to the perfect solution, which is all the good stuff with none of what's deemed to be the bad, fail to get there, just as Theresa May's got, leave on no deal, and then forge our own path. Forge temporary deals with Japan, China, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Canada, America. Get temporary interim deals in place, which restore a lot of the supply line for stuff that comes from outside of Europe in through Europe. And every time we sign a deal, our position gets that little bit sweeter, that little bit better. And uh, the Germans will have to, we'll have to pay tariffs on cars and wine and cheese and all these things that we bring in. Okay. Okay. And they'll come back to the C table and they'll try and... OK, Femi? A couple of things. Um, regarding no deal, which you say which you say would be temporary, I mean, there's also the issue of just how temporary is temporary because a lot of what you said would take time. Even these temporary deals would take time. But the thing is, there are two main issues with no deal. Uh, well, there's the economic hit, but we can all argue about the economics of things. But let's just go with the two things. There are 1.4 million British people who currently live in countries across Europe. Now, their right to live in their own homes are based on the fact that they are EU citizens. If, we, if they stop being EU citizens, which is what happens with Brexit, and there is no deal in place, they lose the right to live in their own homes. That's 1.4 million British people who then have to apply to each individual national government in order to stay in their own homes. And that's a betrayal of 1.4 million British people. Second thing, the Northern Irish border. We've spoken to the WTO, which, which has confirmed that if we leave on no, on no deal in WTO Joe terms, there needs to be an, a border in, in Northern Ireland because there will be different customs arrangements between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, which means a hard border, which means violating the Good Friday, Friday Agreement, an agreement which ended uh, um, decades, you could argue centuries of, of, of violence, which was, which in the last in the 20 years prior resulted in 3,600 deaths, which that would be a betrayal of the people of Northern Ireland. Now, as far as that, I do not believe that the 17 million people who voted for Brexit voted to do that to the 1.4 million uh, people living in, across the across the channel or Northern Ireland, especially with that history. OK, well, on your first point, uh, it works the other way as well. My partner's actually Polish, living in this country. Uh, she herself said that had given the vote, she would have voted for Brexit, believe it or not. Um, and she would have voted to leave because she doesn't like the way the country's going. And... If we start charging, if we start trying to get people to apply for visas and uh, Europe do the same, it's just going to create a lot of bureaucracy for everyone. You honestly believe that they, they're going to pursue that route? It won't, to, it, it, won't, it, it won't be up to the EU. That's the whole point. Once we stop being EU citizens, we then become what's called third country nationals, i.e. like anybody else from around the world, which means each individual country will then be able to decide whether or not they treat us. So if they, for example, um, don't have many um, of, their, of, of their nationals in the UK, but we have a bunch of nationals on their country, they'll have no interest in protecting, our, in pe protecting people from Britain. OK, uh, I mean... I, I, so, okay, so temporarily, we, the people might have to apply for visas, and Te temporarily, it might have to be a border in Northern Ireland. But in all honesty, if it gets us away from a place where there has to be a 10,000-word document on how to grow cabbages, 
and all the oh, other Oh, Craig, you were doing so well. Mean, you were doing so well, mate. You were doing so well. I was thinking, do you know what? He's thought this through. He's 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 making some sense, and you were doing so well. And then you'd have you had to go and throw in some utter rubbish that was printed in the Express or the Mail or somewhere. You're going to talk to me I about Bendy either. Bananas next. I mean, come no, on, no. Craig, come no, on. The, the, really? Is that what's bothering you? Ten thousand word document on cabbages? Is that it? Is that what you want? No. The EU haven't had their budget signed off in goodness how many years. But but, okay. but sorry, sorry, Craig, Craig. I just pointed out that what you've that what you're suggesting means that 1.4 million British people lose the right to live in their own homes, and that the document that basically ensured peace in Northern Ireland would be ripped up by by what you're suggesting. And your response is literally cabbages. Okay, if if the only thing keeping peace in Northern Ireland is the ability to cross a road without going through a barrier, then I think there's a bigger problem at hand there. Okay, oh, okay. that's but, that's but people, okay. That Do you know what? Please, please. You know what, I, 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 Craig? I, I honestly, on on that point, I would I would very much like you to go visit Northern Ireland and visit the people who actually live there and ask them whether or not how much they value the, the Good Friday Agreement. Because I think when you speak to people who have lost family members over a war that was ended by the Good Friday Agreement and tell them that you prefer cabbages instead. I think they'll have something to say. Yeah, Craig, thank you for your call. I do appreciate it. But um, And I thought you were doing so well there, but then you came up with cabbages. Um, uh, we're, we're, we're fast approaching uh, running out of time, uh, Femi. Tell me, um, you see, I, it's quite interesting, that call, because uh, I've been trying to figure out a way to deal with people who passionately believe in Brexit mm. and who come up with this stuff. And I... Contrary to what people think of me and uh, the stuff I've been called, and I'm sure you've been called worse, mm. um, I do care, and I don't see those people as idiots. Mm. I don't see them as uneducated. I think ha what you described in Sunderland, had I grown up in Sunderland working at a Nissan factory, I would have voted I'd for have Brexit. Voted as well. For sure. Yeah. For sure I would have voted for Brexit. Um, and I am trying hard to see what the best way it is to deal with people. Now, I've I've often debated that people were duped, people were scammed, people were sold a dud, people were uh, it, it, the, the the scam that is called uh, it, it, my scamming, my hustling world is called the bait and switch. Right? You bait with a wonderful shiny object, you get the sale, and then you switch it, and you go, actually, well, you're not going to get that. You're going to get a sack of potatoes. Mm -hmm. We did it on the real hustle many times. Um, it's currently illegal to do a bait and switch, by the way, uh, under the the trade trading standards. But Brexit seems to have got away with it. Anyway, let's let's move on from there. But how do you explain to people that they have been duped? Because people don't like to admit it. Uh, I've dealt with a lot of victims because I've carried out a lot of scams. And people, that's the worst thing that they, they will never admit to having been duped. So how do we solve this? My, I, th I think the, the, the best way I have found is to try and go over the facts, over the facts again and again and explain them. Try not to cherry pick, just say, look, this is what it is. How do you feel about it? I mean, how do you find speaking to people? What do you think the best methods are to try and get people to understand the impact of that decision? Well, I mean, regarding the whole educated thing, I said before, if I hadn't studied EU law, I could not guarantee you which way I would have voted. And the ballot paper said, leave the European Union. And what that means is, end the, the, European, the Treaty on the European Union, the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, and all the laws associated with that. Now, did everybody read all those laws and all those treaties? No. What did we do? We trust. We trusted our politicians to give to give us the facts. We trusted our politicians who said that if you vote to leave the EU, you will have more control over your country. You will have you will have more. You will have a better NHS, and you'll be better off. Now, what they've delivered is something that goes directly against that. So that's what we talk about. We go to them and mm. ask, all right, what did you want from Brexit? Why did you vote for Brexit? And we say, all right, you wanted a better NHS, you wanted a bit more control, you wanted better off. We recognise those things. We do not disagree on the values that those Brexit voters share because everybody should want more control. Everybody should want a better NHS. It's the best thing about the country. And the fact is, the government has failed to deliver what they promised. This is not the fault of Brexit voters. This is the fault of the government and the fault of the politicians who have failed after after decades of failing the country. They've made things even worse. The most democratic way forward as a people's vote. Femi, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, having you in the studio. We've run out of time and it's flown by. Mm. Uh, and thank you to all the texts, the tweets and the callers. You're off to Brussels. Yes, uh, I'm catching a 9.30 bus. Thank you so much. <laughs>